Okay, so part two, we're going to think about gender theory. So we'll start with gender stereotypes and thinking about masculinity and how masculinity is part of um, a, a stereotypical presentation of gender. So some probably quite recognizable stereotypes around masculinity are the idea of strength, um, being assertive, being competitive, the idea um, that a man might be protective of, um, of uh, the women and children in, in his life, um, the idea that um, masculinity is about not caring about your appearance, um, but being um, uh, unemotional and very logical, um, being rational rather than emotional or intuitive, and the ideas of having a, a high libido and being preoccupied um, with sex a lot of the time. Femininity, on the other hand, um, carries stereotypes around being soft and understanding or gentle, nurturing, caring. Um, the idea that um, femininity is about um, caring a lot about appearance, um, being perhaps in intellectually limited or being guided by emotion rather than um, ra ration rationality, um, being quite useless at practical activities, um, not being too bothered about sex, and being more concerned about romantic forms of love. So the previous descriptions of masculinity and femininity are forms, as I've said, of gender stereotypes. And of course, none of us actually fits um, perfectly into any of these stereotypes. But again, just coming back to the difference between sociology and just looking at the individual, these are about social constructions of masculinity and femininity um, that are representing dominant traits which we assign to people based on what we perceive their gender to be. So that perception is very important. So it's not about the reality or any kind of um, innate characteristic. It's about how these are socially formed around these um, stereotypes that become embedded in the expectations around what it is to be a particular gender. And to most people, these social gender identity characteristics seem natural um, and um, people might strive to match them even though they may not feel entirely comfortable doing so. And that's because of those broader social expectations that we encounter in different social contexts, whether that be at school or university or at work, in the family um, and in leisure spaces. Um, and in the media, and so on. Um, and we have an idea around gender, and it's um, the idea of um, this binary, um, that there's a kind of natural complementarity around gender. So um, binary thinking kind of becomes um, a, a part of the way we think about other natural things, like night and day, yin and yang, positive and negative, and that, that way of thinking, that binary way of thinking that's embedded um, in um, Western thought um, and some Eastern uh, um, ways of thinking too, um, becomes a way of thinking about gender. So this binary of man and woman um, becomes um, reproduced um, over, over generations. And though there are sociobiologists who believe gendered traits are biologically determined, sociologists tend to think that gender is socially learned. So rather than it being something that we're born with, it's something that we learn over time through socialization, um, through our, our everyday um, encounters with the social world. And we also learn about the different kinds of rules and norms and values and expectations within um, different social contexts um, that um, constrain our behavior. And the most prominent theoretical perspective is that we are socialized into these gender roles from a very early age. 
So from the time we are born, and sometimes even before we're born, um, we are socialized along gender lines. So, you know, this goes to even um, the way we think about um, colors, um, the idea that girls wear pink um, and boys might wear blue, um, that there are appropriate toys for girls to play with and inappropriate ones for boys to play with. So dolls, for example, are, are an example of, of that. Um, the kinds of role play that girls might be encouraged to engage, like being a princess or being a ballerina or domestic forms of play, um, having a baby doll and, and being a mother, for example. Um, whereas boys might be socialized into um, much more um, active kinds of ways of being with the toys that they're given, like trucks um, and swords or guns, encouraging them to maybe um, uh, pretend around and play around violent behaviors um, or um, practical ones like fixing a car, having a toolbox, for example, um, being a doctor or being um, a nurse is very gendered as well in terms of um, the, the way that's commercialized. So here we have a blue box for the doctor and a pink doc, uh, box for the nurse. And um, in addition to being socialized into these roles and learning the ways that we are expected to conform into those roles, we're also socialized into heterosexuality. Um, so um, we learn about um, heterosexuality very, very early um, through the stories that we're told, through media, um, through powerful representations um, around um, cartoons or animation. And here we have the Sleeping Beauty as an example, or Snow White actually, in that um, particular image. And um, we learn this not only in the family from our parents, but also from our peers at school, from our siblings, um, and from the mass media. Um, so it's also something that doesn't just happen overnight or at a certain stage in our lives. We're continuously engaged in processes of socialization throughout our lives and into our adulthood. So for example, in the workplace, um, at clubs, um, at, um, at different kinds of uh, social spaces that we might engage in and um, either explicitly or implicitly encounter these different ways in which um, we're encouraged, um, uh, we're, we're um, invited to conform to particular kinds of, of gender socialization um, processes. And so how does it happen? So how do we become socialized? So some of that can be um, kind of uh, more subtle. Um, so for example, um, through imitating behaviors or mannerisms or speech from um, what we see um, in adults in our lives or in the media, for example. They might be through verbal encouragement, um, even things like, oh, good girl. Um, or discouragement, boys don't cry, um, or physical sanctions and rewards even, where we're given rewards for um, acting in particular ways, or we might be punished um, if we're a boy and we like a, um, to play with Barbie dolls. So there's very different ways that um, in everyday life, these can um, become subtly and also explicitly part of the way we learn um, about gender socialization and what we what um, norms we sh are expected to take up, and um, these are social sites um, in which socialization occurs. So the primary um, social site might be the family, in which we're you know we we start learning gender roles from very very early on in our lives, um, or secondary ones from childcare centers, nursery schools. Um, to um, primary and high school, for example, and then tertiary sites of socialization through our peers, um, through um, even observation of other people that we don't know very well, um, through various different role models, um, and through the media 
um, which is a very important social site of socialization, including um, you know, mainstream media and also social media. So gender socialization in the media is a very powerful form of socialization. And there's no question that masculine and feminine behavior is portrayed in often a very stereotypical way. Um, and you know, these are quite stark um, images that might be familiar to us in the ways in which we um, see gender taking place um, uh, in, in quite um, sexualized ways and, um, and you know, in terms of the way that we're socialized into heterosexu heterosexuality as well. So gender and sexuality are very um, much in relation to each other. So we've, we learn these gender stereotypes in relation to sexual ones as well. And we also learn it through marketing. Um, and we learn that very young, through catalogs, for example, um, through being at the checkout and seeing these different kinds of um, ways that um, products are marketed and packaged. Um, and um, this is a really great um, YouTube video that you might want to follow up on that um, helps us to think about the ways that companies work very, very hard around selling their products along gendered lines. And it may be that in, in actual fact, we're buying almost the same product, but it's marketed to be for women or for men in particular ways. And the social construction of gender is also about not just um, the idea of our identity, but how we perform gender, how we do gender, that gender is, is active, it's, it's a verb rather than just something, that, a noun. Um, so um, this idea is that it's through our practices, the ways that we act, the, the things that we do, even the body language that we take up, the way we might sit, um, the kinds of clothes we decide to wear, the jewelry that we decide to wear, um, the kinds of um, exercise we might decide to take up or the different sports that we engage in um, or the different leisure activities all of these are practices They're, they are things that we do um, that construct masculinity and, and femininity around normative lines and normative expectations um, so doing gender is assuming and creating difference that are uh, differences that are not necessarily physiological that are constructed around ideas, around what it is to be a woman in society or what it is to be a man in society. And again, that tends to perpetuate and reproduce binary constructions of gender around women and men, masculinity and femininity, male and female, and also um, notions of, um, of um, normative forms of sexuality, around heterosexuality. And using these assumptions and socially constructed differences reinforces the notion that gender is, is natural, that because we see um, the majority of, of people taking up these normative expectations and these kinds of normative behaviors, that that becomes seen to be um, a, a natural thing rather than something that is being constructed socially through processes, processes of socialization. Okay, so that's the end of part two.